นะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมบุทธัสสะบุทังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสามิเรา to be here at uh, Three Jewels uh, yeah, in the, the Fort Bragg area and uh, must admit it's a little strange to be here without Metika since she was such a uh, powerful character very uh, significant being and being in this place without uh, her welcoming and um, cheerful and slightly curmudgeonly <laughs> presence. It's a, it's a, a, no, a noticeable shift, a noticeable absence. Uh, but I'm very, very glad that um, I wish to uh, bequeath this place to our community that's taken shape, as she had spoken uh, of uh, to me many, many times over the years. That she really wanted this place to eventually come to uh, the monastic community, and so. I'm very pleased to see that's come about. a j a n Kasapo, a j a n t i t i p a n o and Kevin being here through the uh, the rains retreat and um, and on in, into the the future. So the three jewels uh, into the a new phase, different phase of its uh, its existence. But uh, uh, I am very much reminded of Metika, dear Metika, being uh, being here. I'm glad to see her picture upon the shrine uh, as well. Her name Metika means uh, one imbued with loving kindness. Of her nature, she also, um, her, with her very sharp sense of humor, she re- often would refer to herself by her alter ego name Dosaka. Uh, Meta is loving kindness. Dosa is aversion. <laughs> so she would refer to herself as Dosaka. The other, uh, the kind of shadow side of Metika was Dosaka. Mm-hmm. And then with her great wit and um, and uh, the skill with uh, Buddhist practice, she would uh, recognize those you know, aversive, reactive, um, uh, afflictive tendencies of mind. That was you know, that was Dosaka speaking or thinking. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, in a way, it's uh, I, I felt this was was very skillful the way she would do this because uh, it's. Kind of a joke, kind of not a joke, <laughs> but that very way of naming uh, those uh, unhelpful, uh, afflictive, uh, difficult, uh, reactive patterns of mind, um, naming them as the, uh, the attributes of the the aversive one, <laughs> the uh, the the uh, the irritated one, that uh, in a way that's expressing a quality of loving kindness uh, towards those very states. Okay, because when we th- we speak of metta, loving kindness, it can seem just to be a, a quality of um, say uh, expressiveness. It's an outgoing quality. It's one of the Brahma Viharas, uh, the the sublime abidings, which we describe as being abundant, exalted, immeasurable. They're a great radiance of the heart. But uh, metta, uh, when talking about it and talking about the practice of Of developing uh, metta, loving kindness, uh, I, I like to point out that it really has two dimensions. There is an expressive part, which is the may all beings be happy, may I be happy, may all beings be happy, uh, radiating kindness over the entire world. There is that that dimension of um, loving of the practice of loving kindness, but the other dimension is one that is receptive. It's an that, uh, and I like to talk about this as. As a radical acceptance, an openness of heart, it's that quality of the heart that says everything belongs, whether we like it or we don't like it. Here it is, <laughs> uh, whether we approve or don't approve. Here it is, uh, and that uh, I feel just like the in breath and the out breath. Um, there's a, an expressive part of the breath and a receptive part of the breath. 
It's the receptive part, that which is taking in the oxygen, that's the real power source, that's the real heart of the breathing process, that's the purpose of the breathing process, is to bring the oxygen into the body and uh, then the the, express, uh, the expressive aspect of the breath is to release the carbon dioxide and and to let that go. In a way, I feel that the essence of loving kindness, its real heart, is radical acceptance. That receptive aspect of of uh, of the uh, the heart, that which can attune to the way things are and be open to uh, to all the qualities of the present moment. And as I was saying about Metika, how she would uh, refer to her grumbling mind or her tendencies to, to seek the way to a, an enlightenment through complaining. But, uh, but no one, no one, even in California, no one's written a book, you know, The Way of Complaining. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they have, actually. I'm, I'm, maybe I'm being presumptuous. Have to take a look through the bookshops and see if the, you know, the, uh, the spiritual path of complaining. But, uh, but to... That that was her way of of accepting those parts of her character that uh, that which was tending to find fault or to grumble or to complain. Her way of receiving that and acknowledging, yep, there there she is. <laughs> Dosika is uh, active uh, again. It's a way of saying, yes, here is this mind that is complaining or criticizing or is discontent. Here it is. It's this way. And that very act of acceptance or recognition is, uh, in a way, there's, it's providing more space around those habits of mind, those tendencies, and they're providing a, a quality of, of uh, freedom and ease. Because uh, when we are able to recognize our mind states, either if they're very uh, positive or energetic, um, uh, and inspired, or whether they are um, uh, say, uh, melancholy or irritated or negative, afflictive, or somewhere in the middle. The, the, the uh, capacity of the heart to know those states, this is a state of sadness or grief, this is a state of excitement, inspiration, this is a state of things being absolutely ordinary. <laughs> the, that the heart that knows, here, here is a state, this is what it is. It's 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 sweet. It's bitter. It's it's neutral. Then that's providing a, a spaciousness around those states. The mind knows. Oh, this is a a passing mood. It's a pattern of experience. Uh, it maybe it's something that's very delicious and very very beautiful. Here it is. It's just a, a delicious, beautiful mind state. If it's very painful or difficult, oh, this is something painful, ugly, difficult. Here it is. It's just like this that we're able to respond to those states of mind rather than react. And uh, I distinguish those two by, by, in a way, saying if we react, if something is pleasant, we chase after it, we try and own it and keep it. If something is, is painful or difficult, we push it away, we try to escape from it. That's the reactive patterns of mind. To respond is to know, well, this is uncomfortable. <laughs> Here it is. This is exactly what I didn't want to happen. Uh, and it just happened. Here we are. It feels like this. this we have a couple of potters in the, in the room, work hard to throw a beautiful large pot, and it's come, gone through the, the, the baking process in the kiln. Everything is great. Fine. Put it on the stand. And then, turning a little bit too sharply, the elbow catches it and kapoom. It's not a pot anymore. <laughs> oh, well. Has the week's work gone? <laughs> well, it was, uh, and, and there it is. There's the, you know, the broken pieces on the floor. That's what the pot is now doing. It's that, that's the shape it has now. So that's exactly what we didn't want, but here it is. Uh, that, and the heart that is able to respond knows this is a painful feeling and doesn't add anything to it. You're not pretending that the painful is pleasant or that you liked it or you didn't. You're, you're glad that you knocked that pot off the shelf <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, have to go back to, to square one to start, uh, start again. But here it is. This is the way it is. And 
Similarly, when things are really delightful or pleasant, uh, enjoyable, then we are, are able to recognize, well, this is sweet. This is exactly what I wanted. And not only have I made what I feel is a wonderful pot, but people are really pleased with it. And, uh, and it's making everyone happy. When they look at it, they go, wow. <laughs> <laughs> that makes my heart glow. Yeah. And so uh, uh, that everyone's happy. So that, uh, that well, this, this is the everyone's happy feeling. That's all. We don't have to get drunk on it. We don't have to, don't have to get carried away. We don't have to feel I've got now. I've got to do it again. Oh no! <laughs> you know, the burden of responsibility. Now they're going to expect me to do this every time. <laughs> oh no! No, it's just well. This is one that came out just perfect. Okay, one in a thousand is like that, like Dhamma talks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that came out right. Okay, that's it. You know, whether it ever happens again, doesn't matter. So <laughs> that uh, that kind of um, spaciousness uh, is what I mean by responsivity. So when we are cultivating the heart of, of loving kindness, genuinely being the metika, the embodiment of kindness, for, which is you know, the Buddha's encouragement for, for all of us to... Um, establish that quality of, of kindness, of friendliness in the heart, then that, uh, I would say, the, the core, the essence of that is this quality of, of radical acceptance. Uh, and one of the points about this that uh, Ajahn Sumedha would often stress is, uh, and would <laughs> underscore several times, acceptance doesn't mean approval. You're not trying to make yourself like the unlikable. You're not trying to make the bitter sweet, or that if if um, someone has treated you really badly, or you're being uh, you've been really harmed, or something has been done, in, uh, something's happened in your life in the world that's really unfair, that's cruel, you're not trying to make yourself like it or say, "I'm glad this has happened," or "This uh, uh, I'm uh, I'm got to find a way to enjoy this." It's like no, it's it's bitter, it's painful, it's difficult, but here it is, and so that that. Acceptance means a, a, an openness of heart and a, a readiness to, to, to deal with the situation. M many, many years ago, I met a family, and very tragically, the daughter, a teenage daughter in the family, um, was found to be very seriously ill. And uh, I was talking with, with the mother after, some months after the daughter had passed away, and she said when they first went to the doctor and got the diagnosis, she said, the doctor said, well, the news, the news is either awful or bloody awful. And she said, I wanted to punch him. Uh, and and uh, I thought, well, how awful, I mean, how, how, uh, how rude, how, uh, how, how uncaring. She said, later on I realized he was a really good doctor. <laughs> and that was actually uh, to let us know immediately uh, to, uh, and the, the, the extent of the illness and the little time that was uh, going to be available, said, uh, I did want to punch him first off, <laughs> but then I realized he, it was tough for him to, to say that, but it was a great kindness that it was a horrible news that your, you know, your, your daughter's not going to make it um, in all likelihood, uh, but, uh, we'll, but also you know, we'll do what we can to, to uh, make things good for her. And so that that you're not trying to uh, say uh, hide away or ignore the difficult aspects of life. Say like that, a, a fatal illness, um, and you're acknowledging, yeah, this this is this is bad news. This is terrible news. But that uh, capacity of the heart to say, okay, well, this is not what I'd like to hear. This is not not beautiful. Not uh, not something that is delightful in the world, but here it is. This is part of the, the living system and, and it, it's arrived. So we find that we, uh, that extra spaciousness of the heart enables us to find a bit more room, find a bit more capacity within us to, to work with life as we find it and we're able to, to uh, um, go with the, uh, and deal with the, the changes uh, that are uh, say, being asked of us, or that uh, that we're going to be, we are being faced with. 
So that uh, uh, I feel this is a very, very helpful uh, point to, to stress. And, and if those of you who've read Ajahn Sumedho's books and heard his talks and many, many uh, recordings of his teachings, that uh, this is a really significant point. But it's not easy to do. That because in in our minds we think if we accept something we're saying okay we've got to try and make ourselves see it as good or right <laughs> but uh, that's not that's not the aim that's not the request uh, or the the expectation uh, uh, there's the acknowledgement this is this is difficult this is painful this is this is challenging but here it is and it's the here it isness. That is what is being addressed in terms of, uh, of acceptance. Uh, earlier on this evening, at the beginning of the, the tea time, someone was asking about spiritual friendship. I'm not sure if that gentleman is still here. Probably. <laughs> so that, uh, and what constitutes spiritual uh, spiritual friendship? And I would say that uh, there's. Um, uh, this is something that was un, uh, was uh, stressed by by the Buddha as being extremely important. So, when we want to um, cultivate loving kindness, then uh, it's really aiming to be a, a friend or to to treat I mean, all other beings with that heart uh, of uh, openness, that uh, welcoming, uh, accepting heart. Not always easy to do, but uh, that. Um, being a spiritual friend for, for all beings uh, is something that I would say we do have the capacity for have that openness of heart to to, uh, to receive or to know all beings as they are and to find a place in our heart for, for all beings the, um, uh, the passage that was being quoted earlier on today was where Ananda comes to the Buddha, and uh, and it seems that there's a there's an unspoken preamble to this, and it's, it it seems as though Ananda had been talking with another of the monks, and the this other monk had been saying yeah, something like meditation is really the the the, the essence of, of the master's way, and we have to you know, meditation is the only thing that really matters, and Ananda who is always a bit of a, a, a softy and a kind of a friendly personable. Uh, a uh, helpful character who was always trying to make everything right, and, and he was a the kind of the the Buddha's social secretary, PA. <laughs> that uh, he was always trying to make things right between people, and very kindly, very thoughtful, very attentive. And so uh, it seems as though he'd been having a discussion with this other monk, saying, "Well, I think it's not meditation isn't everything. I think spiritual friendship, Kalyana Mitata, that is a, that's half of the holy life. That's half of the." spiritual practice and so he's gone to the buddha and then he asks this question and say you know spiritual friendship this is half of the holy life isn't it and the buddha said not so ananda as he frequently did not so ananda it's not half the holy life it's the whole of the holy life uh, it's spiritual friendship and so that um, a very significant statement by the buddha and is often often quoted and uh so I, I feel it's it's good to uh, ponder that and to, to explore. Well, why why would the Buddha have said that? Why would he make such an emphasis on spiritual friendship? And I, I feel it's it's borne out in the fact that you know, he put a huge amount of effort into creating spiritual community, because uh, and so that, and we call it the, the the third of the three jewels is the sangha, the the, the sangha and. A huge amount of the Buddha's effort and in the teaching was establishing the monastic order of nuns, of monks, and, and the uh, and the lay communities, uh, lay women, lay men, uh, the, what they call the fourfold assembly, and uh, establishing the Vinaya rules, the monastic discipline, and the, the precepts and structures of life for, for lay people to to live by. He put a huge amount of effort and attention into that, and I think principally because. It's really hard for us to make it on our own. <laughs> we need each other, and that uh, and my kind of sort of finger in the wind estimate is like maybe one in a hundred million, yeah, or maybe yeah, yeah, about a hundred. One person in a hundred million people can really 
to make it from ignorance to enlightenment on their own. The other 999,999 mm-hmm. uh, are, uh, we need each other. We, we, uh, we need the support of each other. And that for the vast majority of people, spiritual practice, it's a relational process. We need each other. Uh, we, we, uh, and I think one of the reasons why the Buddha put so much emphasis on Sangha and spiritual community was he realized if my teaching is actually going to ever work, <laughs> if all these words are really going to help living beings to realize uh, complete enlightenment and free the heart from greed, hatred, and delusion, they, everyone's got to work together. We have to, we have to learn how to, to live together, to support each other, to look out for, for each other. So he established this vast array of structures and, uh, and principles uh, in the Vinaya discipline and in, in his, his many and various teachings to, to help back that up so that we could be more easily work together and, and uh, say support each other and, and I've said many, many times that myself, I, I, without the, the monastic community, without the, the, uh, these structures that the Buddha established, I wouldn't have a hope. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, not, I'm not being modest, yeah. or you know, <coughs> o- overly humble. I think I, I, I'm trying to do this by myself, just under my own steam, figuring it out on my own and without a, 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 an array of spiritual friends to uh, of you know, like-minded people around that to, to to follow and to to be inspired by and to to sort of share common values i wouldn't be able to hold it together on my own <laughs> uh, it's uh, i'm far too distractible <laughs> and, uh, far, far too interested in far too many things and i would never have met uh, quite honestly i never would have managed to maintain the kind of focus and singleness of mind that uh, I've been bl- blessed to, with for the last 45 years or so. So uh, I'm extremely grateful <laughs> that, the, that, that the, this emphasis was made in this particular spiritual path. And, that, um, uh, and I do feel that that in terms of um, uh, our the spiritual potential, uh, that uh, we we need each other, and we we can be uh, grateful for the support and friendship guidance we get from each other. But also, part of spiritual friendship is that you can be that that for other people as well. You can be the spiritual friend. It's not just what you get from others to help you along, but also your own effort, your own commitment, your own uh, the, uh, heartfelt. Uh, the, um, Aspiration helps other people. It's a two. It's a two-way street. That, that your your commitment, your uh, say, uh, uh, readiness to, to to practice, that uh, you can be a spiritual friend to others. And so often we forget that we think me. No, no, no. I'm <laughs> I'm just occupying space here. You know, I'm not. I don't really make much of a difference. I'm not really that important. You know, I can't think of myself as a a kind of uh, a light, uh, a light to the world, but uh, uh, it's that's what the, the a sangha is made of. It's made of you know, individual people. We might feel that we're really grateful what we get from others, and we don't really contribute that much ourselves. But um, I do feel it's it's good to acknowledge that yeah, that you uh, uh, by joining together, sitting together, um, studying and practicing the teachings together. You, you do provide support for others, that uh, you are a blessing in the lives of other people. Of course, if you get egoti- egotistical about it, I'm really a blessing in your life, you're so happy, to, you know, you're so fortunate that I'm around, you, know, you should be really happy that I live next door to you. But, uh, you're so lucky, you're so lucky I'm in your life. You know. but that's kind of ego mania. <laughs> that's not very helpful. But uh, I, I do feel it's it's uh, helpful to recognise that um, we the, the effort that we make uh, is a contribution to others. When uh, uh, also earlier on the, in the the tea time discussion, we were talking about um, stream entry, which is the first level uh, of enlightenment, 
and um, the uh, uh, one of the the teachings that uh, Ajahn Pasno is very uh, very um, very, uh, very keen to pass on and talks uh, talks about very very regularly is what is called the four qualities supportive of stream entry, and uh, uh, that you know, again the Buddha spoke about many times. And the first one of those four is drawing close to good people. Sat purisa sang seva. Uh, sat means good or true. Purisa means person. Sang seva um, means sung is together, uh, and seva is to associate. So uh, drawing close and associating with good people. Drawing close to and associating with good people. Sat purisa sang seva. It's a very long Pali word. But that's the first condition for support, uh, supportive of stream entry, is uh, who you hang out with, <laughs> uh, who who you draw you draw close to. If you draw close to good people, uh, and make the effort to 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 um, be uh, say uh, guided uh, by and inspired by uh, wholesome, good-hearted, uh, like-minded people, that's uh, setting helping to set the conditions for the heart freeing itself from. From all greed, hatred, and delusion. The the other three of that list are the second one is taking the time to listen to good teachings, sadhamma savana, so listening to good teachings. And nowadays with the internet and YouTube uh, podcasts and whatnot, there's more Dhamma talks than you can <laughs> than you have there's hours in a day to, to listen to. There's kind of vast amounts of material. <laughs> And very good, very good teaching. So there's, uh, but also I would say gathering together person to person uh, is uh, and listening to teachings or uh, drawing close to the teachings. I know Metika used to have little dhamma discussion groups that, that would take take shape here on the coast from time to time. Those are great. I think just making the time to get together and and look at a sutta and say, I don't know what this means. <laughs> And they're digging into it together and, and working out what uh, what the meaning and the value is of teachings together. Marvelous! Uh, I was always be very supportive and delighted to hear that uh, Metika had that kind of Dhamma study programs and Dhamma explorations going on. So, Sadhamma Savana, that's the second one on the list. The third one is Yoni So Manasikara, which means wise reflection. So, Looking at your life, what makes you happy, what makes you unhappy. When you've succeeded, what do you do with that success? When you failed, what do you do with that failure? Um, when you, you find yourself getting upset in the grocery store, uh, when you find yourself uh, inspired and peaceful, where does that come from? How does that work? Uh, the, the capacity of the mind to see how things relate to each other, the, the kind of pattern recognition uh, faculty of, of the heart, the mind, uh, that's sort of what wise reflection is. It's a kind of a particular kind of intelligence of seeing how things fit together and the cause, how cause and effect work together. So Yoni So Manasikara, wise reflection is the third one. And then the fourth one, which could be a, a, whole, <laughs> a whole kind of uh, Dhamma talk on its own, is practicing Dhamma in accordance with Dhamma. Dhamma no Dhamma Patipada. It's another extremely long Pali word. That means, because often we practice meditation or we, we engage in Dhamma study, Dhamma practice, based on self-view. Like, I need to get more concentrated. I need more wisdom. I've got too many problems. My mind is too busy. Why won't it shut up? I've got to get rid of my chattering thoughts and then I'll be able to. So... All of that I have got, I should, I must, I ought to, is that where the the eye making and mind making virus has sort of <laughs> invaded the system, and so uh, practicing dhamma in accordance with dhamma means learning how to make effort and give direction to your spiritual life, the spiritual practice guided by mindfulness and wisdom rather than guided by. What, um, by I and me and mine, what I want, how I should be, what I ought to have, what I ought not to have. So, but anyway, to, uh, really, I mentioned that, that list, the, f- the four conditions supportive of stream entry, mostly for the first one. Number one on the list is drawing close to good people. And again, as I was saying, it's not just also 
uh, you spending time or, or making the effort to draw close to good people is also being a good person for other people to draw close to. <laughs> you can be a sapurisa, a, a, a good, well-rounded person. Uh, also, I, I like that way of translating sapurisa as a well-rounded being, a well-rounded person. And that we can be that for others, so that we can be that uh, well-rounded, uh, well-rounded being, and provide that kind of spiritual friendship, that spiritual support, that spiritual uh, uh, nourishment for for others. Uh, so I've uh, somehow uh, half an hour has gone by already. I was just warming up to my subject. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very good at short answers. I'm not very good at short dhamma talks either. But, uh, uh, so it's uh, already ten past eight. So I'd like to just uh, offer these thoughts for consideration this evening, and uh, then we can open things up for some discussion for the next twenty minutes or so. Um, Sadhu, 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 anumodam. Well, there was a, a lot of words there, but um, please, anything that I uh, was saying that wasn't clear, or you'd like a little bit more... Um, the information on or, or the things that, that come up that you're curious about, please uh, please do feel most welcome to ask. Don't be shy. This, is, this evening is for all of you. So please do ask whatever would be useful. Did you record the lecture? Can we hear it again? Yes. There's a little black mirror here. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully it's recording, so I think so. Yes. I can always find something. <laughs> um, so, after the last, uh, we, we had a little intermission and we were talking amongst ourselves, and I was. Uh, Contemplating how each the Pasana teacher, you know, teaches according to their it seems like they teach according to their own experience. Mm -hmm. You know, you can see it in their face almost as if like you know, some people look like they're scowling, and your teacher will be like bare knuckling it. You know, and other people <laughs> to look very soft in the, the in the heart. And that's why I was wondering how Asan Cha, the kind of overall teaching he would inculcate in these students on a daily basis as they were going about. Was there any one particular idea or thought that, you know, that you can think of that everybody would kind of agree, yes, this is kind of like the essence of how we should record ourselves in the, <laughs> you know, as we go along. Some people would say, you know, you just, you know, you just have to be mindful. Well, that's well, <laughs> it's interesting because uh, when you, when you go to sangha sangha meetings, the the variety of Ajahn Chahs that are quoted is quite impressive. <laughs> <laughs> but like I was uh, again at tea time, I was saying uh, we don't experience the world; we experience our mind's version of the world. So for some people, Ajahn Chah was this kind of fierce disciplinarian who wouldn't stand for any nonsense and he would just straighten you out you know at the blink of an eye and say don't do this do that and and, uh, and that's their experience that they they kind of picked up that side because he he could be quite uh, quite a blunt or quite abrupt and, and give a very clear direction sometimes I and mean, other people somebody else will say oh, well yeah, Ajahn Chah, he, he always had a wisecrack about everything. Yeah, he was incredibly funny and uh, very, uh, 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 just extraordinarily, extraordinarily quick-witted and could make really clever puns and word plays. And uh, 
that was who they saw. <laughs> That's who they were with. And it's similarly with Ajahn Chah's teacher, Ajahn Man. Um, uh, the the biography of Ajahn Man was written by uh, Ajahn Mahabur, and so and his description of Ajahn Man is like, yeah, it's absolutely yeah, take no prisoners, if, and uh, there's very very direct, very fierce, uncompromising, and so he wrote the biography, and then other uh, people who've been with Ajahn Man a longer time said, that's not exactly how I remember him. <laughs> And that uh, one of the, the uh, so uh, there have been other biographies or other things written about Ajahn Man as well. One of the, the things that, um, uh, actually I think he's still alive, Chakun Viryan, he's over 100 years old now. He was a novice with, with Ajahn Man. And he said, again, Ajahn Man, he was incredibly quick-witted. He had an ex- extraordinary facility with language. He used to be... Um, uh, what they call a more lum singer. It's a kind of Northeast Thai rap battle um, <laughs> style of folk folk song. Like you have two two singers up on the stage, and they have to spontaneously make up verses, and that they take it in turns. And so you you fi- you tr- the one person they they finish with a, a word that's really hard to get a rhyme for, and then the next the the, the other person's got to start and find a rhyme for their word, and then they create their own verse. And the, the music's going on in the background. And so it's like spontaneous versifying. And Ajahn Man, apparently, when he was a teenager, was really, really good at this. And so uh, Chakun Viryan remembers Ajahn Man as being you know, very, very skilled with language, very funny, uh, very quick-witted. And you don't get Ajahn Man cracking jokes in Ajahn Mahabur's uh, biography. So that... Uh, I would say that, uh, going back to the beginning of your question, one of the things probably most people could agree on, <laughs> whether Ajahn Chah was a fierce disciplinarian or a, or a kind of brilliant wit, uh, or, or lots of other things, you know, was that um, the principle of everything being your teacher, that he would he would say, well, I, you know, I'm called the Ajahn, you know, Ajahn means teacher, and I'm sitting up in the you know, in the middle seat, in the, and I'm doing all the talking, but actually it's you who are the teachers, you know, that my job is to help you teach yourselves, and that, uh, so you call me the teacher, but actually <laughs> you, you are, you are the Ajahns, and that uh, uh, that would be a theme he would, he would uh, address over and over, like, his job was to encourage you to learn from everything. So whether it was a pain in your knee, whether it was um, you know, a long and blissful meditation, whether it was getting a, you know, a, f- a third bout of malaria in the, in, in the last year, everything would teach you if you let it. So that, um, that was a theme he visited over and over again. And I think most people would agree on, on that, that uh, the, so the, the wise person will learn from everything success, failure, uh, comfort, discomfort uh, health, sickness everything will be a teacher uh, for a, a wise person so if someone who's foolish they could be face to face with a Buddha and they wouldn't learn a thing yeah, and so that uh, that uh, readiness to learn from, from every circumstance will be uh, probably the the nearest to a middle ground that most people would agree on. But it is, it's kind of a, a interesting when people, when you're in these kind of large Sangha meetings, they say, I remember Lumpur, he said, and, uh, and the others are going, well, yes and no. <laughs> like, well, I don't remember it quite like that. And they're like history, you know, who, whose history book do you read? You know, which version of history? But that, I feel, is, will be the central principle. Yes? Um, I love the whole conversation about spiritual friendship. And um, we live in a pretty tight community in general on the coast. And um, our group of potters, there's more in the room now. Um, we actually all live pretty closely together. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Sangha you know, we don't just meet on the one night a week. 
we have to live with each other. And it seems like a lot more of that is required of us in general now mm -hmm. as a community to really get together and the rubber's meeting the road, you know, in terms of survival mm -hmm. and the stress that's sort of pervasive everywhere. And um, so, yeah, I'm wondering about how or where we can find some teachings about maintaining that equilibrium between individuals, not just internally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, it, it, it starts internally. Um, like I was mentioning those, the, those saranya dhammas, the, the, the causes of, of concord and well-being. So, um, the, um, firstly, maintaining in, in terms of your thoughts and your attitude, that quality of loving-kindness to the, the people that you're working with, you're living with, not that you like everybody all the time. You know, it's kind of asking too much, but you are together. You know, it's family. It's like if you think I need to like everyone, it's like mm, yeah, it's, it's not going to work. <laughs> but you can accept everyone for how they are, and so that's so that and then um, as it sort of branches out into actual interactions. Then, how do you speak? Would, uh, do you use your words to unite people, or do you find yourself making comments that are kind of divisive? Or that uh, I mean, I, I don't know you at all, but apart from meeting today, but uh, you know, if you find that you, you're dropping a comment here and there that's sort of finding fault with someone or making fun of someone uh, in a in a, uh, a nasty way, then to notice that, that yeah that wasn't very kind that was it was funny but it wasn't kind okay that's that was uh, that 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 needs addressing and to to use your speech to uh to bring people together to to unite and to be a force of of a benefit and then actions in terms of uh, looking out for each other Sharing what you what you have, in terms of your resources, someone says you're not using the kiln this week, are you? <laughs> okay. And then you think, well, she's looking really anxious, and I guess I could wait till. Uh, yeah, okay, if you want, yeah, we can we can work something out. Yeah, just being ready to let go of your own agenda. And to accommodate that of others. In terms, of, I mean, I've lived in community for my entire adult life since I was twenty-one, so this is kind of familiar territory. And um, so that readiness to to make space for each other, to you have an intention or an interest, you want to do something, you're planning to do something, and then someone comes along and something happens, and you go, okay. Um, the readiness to adapt. To, uh, to circumstances and to be to to let go of what you are inclined to do in order to to make space for what the others are inclined to do that's a um, uh, and not just to be like a, a you know a doormat if that's not politically incorrect these days but uh, to just be sort of passive and just never state your own peace but to to be ready to to listen and say okay well that does seem to be a bit more important or yeah I didn't think about that okay I can find a way to make space for that well when the, the Buddha came to to visit uh, he'd been in living in a monastery where there was major conflict and so much kind of argument and and uh, friction going on between two factions of monks he'd actually just packed up his bowl and walked off on his own. <laughs> Without taking leave of the of the group, just said okay. He didn't, didn't even say I'm out of here. It's just like he packed his bowl and robe and just left. Uh, that was his. He, he that was his. That was his statement. And he when he, but then he went from there to another place and he found these three monks living together very very harmoniously, and there was a very peaceful, very different atmosphere there. And he asked them, you know, how do you live uh, in this this uh, Easeful, harmonious way, and then one of the the statements that one of the monks makes, he says, "Well, uh, 
uh, well, I, I, uh, I'm ready to set aside what I am minded to do in order to, to do what the, the rest of the group are, are minded to do. And that's how we live together as friendly and undisputing as milk with water looking upon each other with kindly eyes. Mm-hmm. Beautiful mm-hmm. way of, uh, of uh, describing it. So, adaptability and your readiness to, to make space for each other. Also, the, the, to not completely to suppress or, or ignore your own interests or preferences, but just to not let that be dominant. Also, um, I don't know how you have a decision-making structure in your potting collective. That's the correct term. Your pottery, <coughs> pottery family. But uh, uh, if you are a, a, um, a control freak, suffering will follow. <laughs> <laughs> so... Which doesn't mean, again, which doesn't mean to say that you're not ready to take initiative or to have ideas or make suggestions. But if you, if you say, it's going to be this way, we've decided, and, and nothing's going nothing's to get in the way, and that fix, sort of fixity of, uh, of goal or the sense of, of, of personally being in control of things is just guaranteed suffering. Dukkha in the beginning, dukkha in the middle, dukkha in the end. <laughs> uh, so that's one of the things that... I, I live in a monastery with 70 people. And I'm the abbot. I'm, the, I'm the, the guy in the middle. So I have 70, I, I have like 70 people that, uh, on my ship. And I'm, I'm the one holding the wheel. Uh, <clears throat> so it's a big family. And so, if you, if I was trying to control everything, I would die a thousand deaths. <laughs> yeah. you, you can't. But you know, you care, and you're paying attention, and you're ready to give direction where needed. But if you feel like you've got to control things, and uh, in every aspect, then it, it's exhausting, and it also creates a tremendous amount of friction. So, that it's not again. You can't just sort of decide to be that way, but uh, to, le- to learn how to um, attend and to, to care, but not to um, f- try to control everything. Uh, and to trust in that awareness. To, that uh, you know that you care, yeah, you, you know that you're paying attention, um, but, uh, and you're ready to uh, adapt and make space if you need, if it's needed, or to to be assertive if it's needed. But that, uh, if you can establish that moment by moment as a way of functioning, then that's a great. Uh, you find life is much more spacious for you, and also for the people around you. That uh, you, uh, it uh, it's far more pleasant. And uh, and in really in tune with with nature to function in that way. I'm sure there's analogies of working with clay that would be <laughs> you're trying to force the clay to behave like you will. <laughs> you're going to take the shape that I want. It's like oh really? <laughs> Let's see about that. <laughs> you know, the harder the clay is. Uh, the more difficult it is to center. To to get it to get the center, it's just really hard. <laughs> and the softer it is, the easier it is to bring it to center. Yeah. But if it's too soft, yeah, yeah, that's going to mush all over. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a feeling that was the case. <laughs> I've never I've never made any any pots, but uh, but um, I would uh, I would imagine that finding that the the the, the middle. Uh, the balanced texture is, is necessary. So, um, and that, uh, those are, I think, are the, the principal things. And uh, like in the Sarani Adamas, uh, sharing what you have, sharing sort of materially and also uh, mentally, just being ready to, to be unselfish and to. Um, 
uh, to make to offer people your uh, your time, your attention, as well as your material backup where it's needed. That's, uh, that's very very helpful. And then when the the last of those those sarinya dhammas that support concord and well being, um, it uh, it's a uh, maintaining in being the insight that is noble and liberating. As a basic translation, and then when that's explained. Is that 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 insight is the insight into everything being uncertain? That's the the, the truth mm-hmm. of uncertainty. So, basically, the more that you're ready for anything, <laughs> the better it'll work. <laughs> the, you know, as soon as you get complacent or presumptuous, and uh, or, you know, or, or or like fixed on a specific outcome, then. Things will go off, but if you can maintain in being that insight of like life is uncertain, <laughs> and uh, both in in the physical world and the mental world, you know things are uncertain, then that that supports that that quality of adaptability, and so that's the the diff- sustaining that insight into uncertainty, the anicca sanya in Pali, the, the recognition that. Um, your judgments, your your opinions, uh, your material things—they they are all uncertain. That then that sustains a, a kind of sharpness and a keenness of, of attunement to the situation, the time, the place, or what the clay is doing. Well, it said on the packet it was <laughs> it was this type, but it's it's not doing what it should. Uh-huh. Like. Being the abbot of a monastery, when people show up, and you have a particular routine or a particular set of values, and someone is just not quite, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not quite in tune. But uh, yeah, that's the way life is. This building is set, I think, at the, it's either nine degrees or eleven degrees away from the main house. Quite deliberately, when <coughs> Metika designed this straw bale dhamma hall, it's not a straight corridor. Uh, it's not a straight line between this and the, the the rest of the house. She deliberately set it at an angle for that kind of dharmic reason. It's not a life is not a straight line. It's a nine degrees to the horizontal, <laughs> <laughs> and that's that. That's the I think is a, a very admirable principle. I thought, well, well done, Metika, <laughs> because that's how things are in community. Uh, you know, I remember living at a Bayagiri monastery. Um, one particular Ajahn, who will remain nameless, <laughs> it was extremely hard for him. You'd say, "Okay, what we're going to do is this," and we all kind of have, a, have an agreement how things, something's going to be done with, in terms of the routine. And he'd always have to be nine degrees to the. <laughs> <laughs> You're nine degrees off. This. It, but if you say no, you've got to get, you've got to be straight in line. You've got to be absolutely in line with everybody else. He couldn't do it. <laughs> but if you recognize that well, he's always got to be nine degrees to the horizontal, it's fine. But you know that's how he is. He is a great person. He's very, he's very committed, very sincere, very good-hearted. But he can't just say yes. I'll do it that way. Like, that's not in the, not in his lexicon. This can't do that. <laughs> not because of being bloody minded, but just like that is not a shoe that fits. <laughs> but if so, that you realize that when you, you try to force him to, no, you can't do that, you've got to do it exactly this way. And he's, <laughs> but, uh, and so then that will create more and more grief around the people who are living with him. But if you just recognize, okay, he needs things to be nine degrees to the horizontal. Okay, you just account for that and recognize he's got to do things to some, some small degree, it's got to be in his, his, done his way, then fine, everything works great. <laughs> so in terms of community, that giving that latitude, that space, if there's someone who's like, everyone's rowing in time, everyone's, but there's one person who's determined not to, okay, well just don't put them on that yeah, don't put them on rowing. <laughs> yeah, have them there. 
you look after the tiller. <laughs> and so that trying to force everyone to fit a particular pattern won't work. But you know, you can have a doesn't mean you, you don't try and have a, a pattern or there isn't uh, say agreements aren't useful they are, but the way real human beings uh, then just making that space uh, and I, uh, so after a couple of years of living with this admirable being, <laughs> I realized just don't ask him to be in a straight line with everyone else. Just <laughs> if you don't do that, then everything's great. So adaptability is the key to happiness, I often say. <laughs> there was a, 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 just to finish with the, it's after 8.30 now, so we'll finish in a little bit. But, uh, so uh, when Ajahn Sumato was uh, first uh, asked by Ajahn Shah to take up the responsibility of being an abbot, he wasn't. He hadn't been a monk uh, for very long. I think uh, it was 1975, so about seven years. He'd been a monk about seven years. And Ajahn Chah um, asked him to establish a monastery for Western monks. And uh, so uh, the uh, that was in the, the, the spring of 1975. And so what by Chah, the international monastery was started started up. About halfway through the, the rains retreat to, um, in the middle of August, Ajahn Sumedha went over to the main monastery. It's only, it only about five or six miles away. It's quite close. So he made a trip over to go and see Ajahn Chah. And, uh, Ajahn Ch- and speaking of that, you know, Ajahn Chah kind of took one look at him and burst out laughing. <laughs> Sumedha, you, th- you thought it was going to be so easy, didn't you? <laughs> you thought being an abbot was just having a big cushion to lean on. And, <laughs> it's very easy when you're the junior monk you can sit there and, and imagine you know, if I was the abbot I would do this and I wouldn't do that but now you're discovering what it's like aren't you and like, yes, yes, it's terrible <laughs> they won't obey me Lumpur <laughs> and his background was in the US Navy so where you have the chain of command and you have you have um, commands or, or, or a, you have orders and you have to obey an order from the, it comes down the chain of command and if you don't obey then you're in in deep trouble he said, they won't obey me <laughs> and uh, Ajahn Chah gave this example he said it's like uh, well Sumedha you're trying to get all the monks to be the, you're trying to get them all to be the same it's never going to work it's like if you, you had them all lie down on the ground and you, you, they're lying side by side and all their heads line up and you get them all in a nice straight line and then you look at their, their feet are all over the place you know. <laughs> oh no, their feet are all ragged you know, they're, not, they're not in a nice neat line so then you, you go down and you look after their feet you get all the feet to line up and oh no, the heads are out of, you know, out of whack now they're never going to line up tomato so. and that was Ajahn Chah's dis- description so we need to make space for individual um, variations and styles and then you find you can you can function very very comfortably at Amravati we have about 20 25 nationalities very international community where is that and uh, in uh, the countryside just north of London where, where I live uh-huh. Hertfordshire so just north of London, so it's yeah, it's about twenty, twenty-five different nationalities. So it's a big variety <laughs> of backgrounds and conditioning, and, and uh, you have to be um, very accommodating to include everyone. Well, I see it's at uh, eight thirty-seven now by the clock, so it's uh, probably about time to wrap things up. <laughs>